Hi, Roy here on my channel, Roy Reads Anything, where anything includes old magazines. And one thing I really like, or have always liked, is Christmas special editions of publications. Uh, so I thought I'd do a bunch of those, or at least a minimum of one. I've got a long history of saying I'm starting a series and you only ever get one video, so a minimum of one video about Christmas specials. But if I persist, could include some comics, some Victorian stuff, some 1930s stuff, we'll see. But today it's the 1970s and Science Fiction Monthly. So Science Fiction Monthly was a large size, large format magazine published by New English Library. So a, a publisher who produced a lot of science fiction paperbacks. And as you can see from their solicitation for back issues, uh, this magazine very much led on the art because I suppose Nell had a lot of covers, a lot of cover artwork paintings that they could reuse for this purpose and in the huge size no staples so you could take it apart very easily and have like posters um, made a lot of sense although there was a slight flaw in the concept in that although they had a lot of artwork they didn't have an infinite amount of artwork so this is issue 11 and Compared to the earlier issue I was looking at in a previous video, I kind of think the, the the range of art, maybe it's not as good. But we can forgive them all that because it's Christmas, the season of forgiveness. And they've put snow on the masthead, snow and icicles on the masthead. Classic Christmas special stuff. <laughs> and you've got this brilliant painting of a, a moon that is also a Christmas pudding. <laughs> also known as a plum pudding, a, a Christmas table staple in the UK since the 19th century. Um, it's a rich, fruity uh, pudding, and we've had lots of discussion on my Discord about how to make them. <laughs> Um, so, this is great. The only thing that's slightly disappointing is that you don't get a, a hard SF story inside explaining how this state of affairs comes about with the, the Christmas moon, shame, with shame. a plausible scientific basis for this continent of um, brandy butter or cream on the top and, and how it works. Um, but anyway, but you do get lots of cool stuff in Science Fiction Monthly. This was 1974. I bought a bunch of them, which it turned out had once upon a time been delivered by the newsagent or one of their one of their little army of paper boys to a hall of residence in Dr. Jenny's University. Hooray! That is to say, the university she went to, not some personal university she <laughs> set up. Um, so what do I've you got get? I've one of those as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's just not that one. So apart from advertising the glory days of earlier issues, you get an interview with Jack Arnold, film director of things like Incredible Shrinking Man, which is good. It came from outer space. Tarantula, which I read a novelisation of. Um... Yeah, a Josh Kirby cover to a, a Ray Bradbury book. Like I say, it's a fine piece of work. I don't think I'd be rushing to put it on my wall. Uh, and an article about Roger, hey, Roger Dean, Roger Dean. Artist famous for his covers for rock albums, particularly um, albums by Yes, that kind of thing. Loads of bands, actually, but um, it's interesting. There really was a crossover between SF and sort of science fantasy and uh, rock music, progressive rock, and Roger Dean was the sort of link man. Um, I've probably told this story before 
it's not much of a story. Um, <laughs> I went to Roger Dean's house once on a uh, to pick up some objects that a bunch of us needed to load onto a van, and I was very impressed with his spice rack. If you imagine, if you will, one several meters long rack containing every single jar of Schwartz spice. I thought that was pretty impressive. Neat. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah, yeah. No. Um, an article about Olaf Stapledon, classic author, um, and also you get a little story by Stapledon called A World of Sound, which is pretty good. Imagine a world where sound itself creates like entities, so there can be like musical notes and stuff have sort of turned into living things. So interesting, very short story. Painting by Bruce Pennington, who I suspect had lots of blue paint left over from his famous <laughs> cover for Dune <laughs> that he's then used on a cover for Space Rangers by Isaac Asimov. Was it Space Ranger? Space Ranger! Guess that's who it is in the dome. Uh, article about fanzines. I really like this. So it's 1975 and here's your science fiction calendar with giant spiders crawling out at you from a tower for the whole 12 months. Um, and I believe the days will fall on the same days in 2025, so could actually use this in... No! Good, well, we'll but see. we're not having that. <laughs> I'll put it up in my, my special area. Um, illustrated story by David S. Garnett. So that's the kind of things you got in your science fiction monthly. I've actually got another issue from a year later. No, no snow on the masthead anymore, but they have commissioned a, a painting of a, a Christmas cracker, or rather a starship in the form of a Christmas cracker. You see all the little windows and things? Christmas crackers. Do our friends over the pond have Christmas crackers, or is it just some crazy British stuff? Mm. Of, um, I was going to go and get yeah, them, no, but it would knock were, everything I over. No, <laughs> um, yeah. So Christmas crackers, paper tubes, cardboard, small amount of dynamite or some other explosive that you you pull the thing apart and the snap goes bang and inside there's really usually really really crap plastic surprise really 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 bad christmas joke and really, 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 really terrible paper hats. Well, but we have to have them because yeah. it's, it's not Christmas if you don't have Christmas crackers. Like, is it? no, it's and just I think not. Christmas pudding is in the same bracket of because people yes. don't actually like eating yes. it. <laughs> but you kind of got to have it. And you always make us get one. Oh yeah, at least. Um, and I insist that it's barely the size of a tennis ball. Well, we did it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just... Or a moon. <laughs> Talking of gifts, this one has a t-shirt transfer inside it. A free t-shirt, rub-down t-shirt transfer. Which I'm amazed has survived for nearly 50 years. I think um, free gifts in comics rarely do make it. Um, but I suppose you're sort of brow furrowing Chin stroking science fiction readers of 1975 might uh, might be less less bothered about uh, about fripperies like like that. So continuing on, it's it's a it's a year later. There's a good article about Harry Harrison. Um, Harry Harrison with a model of himself. Um, I still love Harry Harrison. Mm. Well, I did when I was younger. Um, and then to make up for the art deficit, they've had an art competition. 
so the artwork tends to come from the public which is oh, fine yeah. but to me that's a bit disappointing you get the Christmas cracker again um, and yeah various bits and pieces I, I won't show you all of this um, art competition stuff I think um, some of the entrants must have been unweaned hungry babies judging by the amount of women's <laughs> Women's bosoms, they have included oh, Lord. in their in their oh. submissions. So um, yes, glossing glossing over them? that. But one thing I did think was quite good, if I can find it, um, as um, it is interesting actually seeing stuff that's from this far in the past, where something like um, Ursula Le Guin's. Um, the Dispossessed is being reviewed as a new book um, and classics like that are, you know, newly minted stuff. Yes, the query box. I think this is a, a masterpiece of damning with faint praise. Uh, somebody asks, as a relative newcomer to science fiction, I've heard much about the new wave. Could you tell me what is new about it and who are its main exponents? Asked Michael Siddall. Askin in Furnace Cumbria and the reply from the, the answer man of this of this publication the so-called new wave in quotes was an attempt to introduce in tradi tra into traditional SF some of the elements of mainstream fiction by modern experimental writers like William Burroughs, Kurt Vonnegut and Saul Bellow. Um, yes that much new wave writing proved almost unintelligible or was frankly pornographic let alone dismal, outraged old-time readers who might otherwise have been won over by the trend towards a more realistic outlook. Um, so, like I say, damning with faint praise, but it does mention uh, a anthology that I've actually got, the new SF, that I'd really recommend. It uh, came out in the late 60s, it's um, got some great stories, some by people who are still really well known, others who you wish they'd written more, like Pamela Zoline. Pamela Zoline, fantastic writer. Um, and I've not heard of this, but I've got to get it at some point. Judith Merrill's patronising selection, England Swings SF. Double Day 1968. Oh, you must get that. I've got to get it. England yeah. swings like a pendulum do. You've got to get it and read it out loud to me. So anyway, yes, a quick look at Science Fiction Monthly, which at the time was the only sort of mainstream science fiction magazine around. You got stories, you got articles, you got artwork. Like I say, the artwork kind of ran out, and I think that might be why it eventually foundered. I wouldn't really be wanting to spend 35p for mainly entries to an art competition but um, although t-shirt print um, so like I say might might do more on Christmas specials um, those were some but either way back soon with something else <laughs>